I'm a clinical psychologist by training. And when I launched into this field, my, my, um, my calling, I felt like I had a life mission statement, and that was to show that the Bible could make you well instead of crazy. And that's true. I had that written down somewhere. And so when I launched into that, that really was what I wanted to do with my life, was to understand how redemption and spiritual growth and faith and God's Word affected the key areas of life that we all care about. You know, the clinical side of life, how we feel, our hurts and owies and depressions and anxieties and all that. Anybody got any of those issues in here? That's all? I'm in the wrong place. Y'all flew me down here for nothing. Come on now, the denial room is down the hall, right? How many of you could say, sometime in my life, I've not felt so good? All right, better, okay. And then the relationship area, and then the performance area of how we bring our gifts to some sort of fruition. I wanted to understand how redemption and spiritual growth affected all that. So what happened was I went knocking on doors to find a job. And my first job happened to be with a leadership consulting firm. And they wanted a clinician because sometimes CEOs and executive teams and Christian organizations and secular companies had been, you know, referred because they've got some issues that they need to work on. And they wanted somebody to do that. And so for the beginning years, I was kind of the leader shrink. I sat there and listened to leaders. And gradually got more interested in the field of leadership and ultimately came to land in a space that I'm going to talk to you about this morning. And that is, I'm going to use a little whiteboard. Can you guys see over there? Yeah, you can see. Okay. Wow, there's a person up there. Um, if you look at the field of leadership on this side, you go to lots of leadership things and you learn how to cast vision and be a change agent and engage talent and build critical mass and all the great stuff of leadership, right? But then what happens is you've got to go out here and you got to do it. And you are the tool that God uses. And what we find is when we get out here in this real space where reality is, we find out that all this stuff we know about leadership begins to have to depend on our abilities to pull it off and that we have issues. You guys just admitted you have issues. I saw your hands. And so what we find is we have to do that and our, sometimes our brokenness and our issues get in the way. And not only that, what's worse is you got to do it with other wackos. <laughs> and you have people and you have boards and you have elders and you have parishioners and you got all these people and our stuff interacts with theirs. And we're thinking, good night. Did God not have a better way to do this? But that's where we are. And so then what happens is we really don't know what to do with that. And there are two options. One is we don't talk about it, and we don't see that there's things we need to work on. And so, as was talked about earlier, we'll act it out in some way. Either it goes inside into a depression or burnout or lose, you know, your drive or whatever it is, or it gets acted out in some way. Or we deal with it, and sometimes we'll go, we'll go into therapy or we'll see a shrink or we'll go to a recovery group or something like that, which is very helpful. But here's what I find. A lot of times we don't make the connection between our personal issues and our leadership. Let me say that again. We don't make the connection between working out these personal struggles, except sometimes when there's a failure or a moral failure or something, you know, then it's time for somebody to get some help. But we don't make the distinction that this, in, the, in this middle space, of working on your completeness as a person is the first service of leadership. Because that doesn't seem, you know, as mountaintop. It doesn't seem as, you know, like taking the hill. It doesn't seem as great as some other things that leaders do. 
But over and over and over, what the Bible tells us is this, that what you end up doing through God, by God, and for God has to flow through you as the vessel. In Ephesians 2, which I'm going to talk about a little bit this morning, Ephesians 2, kind of at the, you know, 8, 9, and 10 place where it's talking about faith and it's through him and his grace. It says this, that you are his workmanship. Now think about that word. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that have been laid down beforehand so that you should walk in them. And I'm going to focus a little bit on that verse specifically about both sides of that. But the first one is that you're his workmanship and he's crafting you so that you are able to do those works and your development, your healing, as we heard a moment ago, your growth is going to affect your ability to be able to be fruitful. Second Peter tells us this very directly. It says that if certain character traits are being built in us, and it lists a bunch of them there. There are a lot of relational things. There's perseverance and there's self-control and there's knowledge and goodness, mutual affection. That all of those character traits are going to affect, it says, our ability to be fruitful or not. So we're gonna focus on just a handful of those this morning. And I want you to look at it this way. I like to think, um, anybody know what that is? Just shout it out. It's a boat, thank you, okay. I'm not an artist, but somebody recognizes it. All right, and if a boat heads across the ocean, what a boat does is it leaves a wake behind on two sides. And you as a leader will leave a wake behind you in two areas. On one side, there will be the mission the fruitfulness, did we accomplish anything? And after you move through your tenure at that church or in the denomination or in that city or whatever it is, we can look behind and see what you left behind in terms of the mission. Did things happen, whatever your mission was? Did you reach that objective, that calling, those good works that God had laid down beforehand? And on the second side, sometimes have you ever noticed this? It happens with pastors. Sometimes pastors will accomplish a mission, but they kill everybody in the process. <laughs> and there are relationships on the other side of the wake. And I would submit to you that in the image of God, that you are these two things. You are a lover and you are a worker. And that the leader of integrity and integrity does not just mean morals and ethics. It means to be integrated, to be a whole person. The leader who is integrated and whole and walks like Jesus walked is in a process of becoming a whole person that is fruitful relationally in the culture and the teams and is fruitful in getting it done. And so that's what we're gonna focus on because the boat is you. So we're gonna focus on a few issues here, what I call the middle space in between leadership and the personal stuff that makes leaders fruitful. Okay, so that's a little bit about where they're headed. I just wrote a book called Boundaries for Leaders and I'm gonna be talking a little bit um, about that this morning. And I'm gonna talk about three areas specifically where what I've seen in working with pastors and working with leaders over the years is that these three areas are huge in terms of resolving and getting to some of the main issues that we carry around to help us move forward. Okay, so that's a little bit about wh where we're headed. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and act like this is easy. You know, that's what psychologists do, right? They sit there and nod and look at you like, you really are screwed up <laughs> and like they're not. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm the first one. So hi, I'm Henry and I'm a really screwed up person. I just want to share that. I, I, I'll t tell you a story um, that I told recently about um, 
you know, this change stuff is not easy for, for any of us. We all have our areas. And one of mine is um, I'm not the most, you know, structured person in the world. And so I need my routines around me, you know, to stay healthy and all that. And if I'm at home and, you know, I'm working out and my wife is, is keeping me away from the bad foods and all that, I'm fine. But what happens is when I get on the road and if I'm traveling a lot and I get off my schedule and all of that, I'd start to get fat. And so I, I was traveling a lot and I wasn't on my routine and I was saying, okay, when I'm on the road, I gotta get this going and I need a routine and I need some help to figure this out, but I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it. And I kept telling myself I was gonna do it and I didn't do it. And then I read one of those stupid books I write and what it said was, <laughs> It said, if you're gonna do something and you tell yourself you're gonna do something and you don't do it and you really wanna do it and you're not doing it, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> and I'm reading this, I'm going, wow, I'm not gonna do this. <laughs> and then I kept reading and fortunately it gave me an answer. It said that grace is God's unmerited favor where he brings from the outside what we need to be able to reach the standard. So it said that you need to get it from the outside, what you don't have on the inside to pull this off. And I said, well, obviously I don't have the structure inside to pull this off, so I'm gonna go hire a trainer. So I go to the gym and I hire a trainer and they assign me this young, skinny, mean woman. <laughs> and I'm there at six in the morning and I'm showing up and I'm so proud of myself because I'm back on the wagon, right? I'm on the, I'm on the program and I'm showing up and I show up and I, day after day after day, and it seemed like three years, my wife says a week and a half, but I'm going and I'm proud of myself. And one morning she's just working me, this young, skinny, mean woman, and she's got me with this bar and I'm working on whatever a core is. And all of a sudden I, I have this awakening. I stopped and I looked at her and I said, oh no. She said, what? She thought I'd pulled a tenant or something. I said, we forgot to take the before pictures. She looks at me and she says, oh, we still can. <laughs> so I'm not gonna stand up here and talk like this stuff, it's easy, but I am gonna tell you that when you get into it, it does help, but it's gonna feel like that when you're in the midst of some of the changes that I'm gonna talk about. Okay, the first one. The first boundary for leaders that I wanna talk about is this. In Ephesians 2, it says that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that have been laid down beforehand that you should walk in them. You know what it does not say? It does not say that you've been created for all good works that are out there. And one of the things that happens with leaders is, it was mentioned earlier, the urgency crowds in and everything's important and it takes all your time and it gets you scattered and you drive your teams and your people and your families and yourself crazy. Because here's what's true. If everything is important, nothing is. If everything is important, nothing is. So many times leaders begin to suffer and the acting out and all of that comes because they're not living in the way or leading in the way that God has designed the brain to actually work. One of the great things we've discovered in the you know, last decade through all the brain imaging and all that is we can actually, there's so much we know about how the brain works now. And one of the things that we can actually see is that there are regions of the brain that fire up and do things to help you accomplish things. And sometimes the way we're trying to work, the brain just can't work. Let me give you an example of one of the ways your brain works. And this is the big one about focus. God has designed you for those good works that for you to walk in those good works, your brain has got to do three things. Number one, it's got to attend to what is relevant. Attend 
to what is relevant to getting those good works done. Okay, now I'm going to list these and I'm going to come back. Number two, it's got to inhibit everything else. It's got to shut everything else out. Number three, very important one, it's got to keep something called a working memory. Now let's go through these. I'll use a simple example for you to, not only the good works that he's laid down beforehand of reaching your city or feeding the homeless or evangelism or whatever your particular calling and mission is about in this season or for life or whatever it is, not only has he called you to do those in the big sense, but also in in all of life, that this is the way the brain works. It's got to know what it's doing in order to do it. Otherwise, it gets confused, burned out, and crazy. But it's not just in those big things. Let me give you a simple example. If you drive your car from here to 7-Eleven, that's a good work, right? Been laid down beforehand so that you should walk in it. There is a path to get there. Your brain has got to do these three things. It's got to attend, it's got to inhibit, and it's got to keep a working memory. Attend. What it's got to do is it's got to focus on some things that are relevant to getting that done. you got to know your speed. you got to know the oncoming traffic. you got to know where the turns are. you got to know the equipment. And you got to attend to all that. Number two, you got to shut everything out. you got to inhibit everything else. You can't be texting while you're driving. Let me say that again. <laughs> you can't be texting while you're driving, or you can't be watching a video, or you can't have somebody screaming at you because it distracts from what the brain and heart and mind and soul need to focus on. And the third thing is I can't drop you out of a time machine into the car and you would know what to do next because you, you need a working memory. You need to be in a flow where something has continuity to it to get anything done. Now, here's what happens with leaders. You start out that way and you have a retreat and you say, this is what my good works are. This is where my attention is going. This is where my giftedness is. This is where my calling is. But then somebody lobs something over the fence of the next project or the next need or the next crisis or the next this or the next new opportunity, which are fine and sometimes they're on track, but many times they're not. And whether it is your marriage, your parenting, your own health and development or the good works that you have been laid down beforehand, I want you to think about, I need to do this in a way that my heart, mind, soul, brain, and everything else is designed to work. And that is that God has called you to specific things that are you and other things that are not you. And I would submit to you that you must get serious first about who you are, what you're good at, what you're called to do, and you and your team and your family, and you figure that out, and you create structures that will keep you on that path so you can begin to say no to the things that are confusing your life and your team and everything else. And this is in every area of life. If you're gonna build a strong marriage, which we just heard about, what are the things that are, you must attend to on a regular basis that are going to build that strong marriage and what do you need to shut out? And sometimes these are a lot of activities, which we'll talk about in a minute. Sometimes they're circles of friends. My wife and I, we have um, some structures that we try to do this. And one of the most important things, it sounds cheesy, but it was so huge, was just a simple date night. We're gonna attend to each other one night a week, and we're gonna have the babysitter already in place, and she shows up, which is, which is the way you gotta do it, right? Because if, the, if you're hating each other and you're in a fight and the babysitter shows up, you still gotta go on your day. <laughs> and see, it's the structure that builds these things in. And so, what are the things you're gonna to attend to with the key stakeholders 
that all the noise is not going to let you get off track. And, and in your ministry, you know, we start so many things and, and get confused. I'll give you an, a business example of this. When Steve Jobs went back to Apple, remember, remember Apple back then? It, was, it didn't even have a pulse. I mean, a couple of geeks in a cult somewhere used this stuff. And Steve Jobs goes back there and he's walking around and there's 30 something versions of the Mac. And he's walking around saying, okay, so if I want to tell my nephew to buy one, which one do I tell him to buy? And it's all confusing. So he brings everybody into a meeting one day and he gets a whiteboard like this and he says, this is crazy. And what he does is down the, down or across the top, he wrote personal and professional. And down the side, he wrote portable and desktop and he made four boxes. And he said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make four computers. If you go into an Apple store today, that's what you find. And what he did was he focused them on what they were about, what they needed to attend to, who the people they were trying to reach were, shut out and inhibit everything else, and keep a working memory. And I would submit to you, if you think about those three things, with your team, with your ministry, with your calling, with what the good works are, that you'll be able to shut out a lot of the other stuff and God will begin to form you around who he created you to be. Number two, to do this, there have got to be some what I called necessary endings. I wrote a book about this called Necessary Endings, and if you think of those two words, necessary ending, it ultimately means this. For whatever God has for you to do tomorrow, it requires probably that you stop doing something that you're doing today. It's a necessary ending. If you go to Ecclesiastes 3, it's a great chapter about seasons and there's a time for everything, it says, a time under heaven. But if you go through it and you look at it, what is it? It's, 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 it's a parallel passage about beginnings and endings. And it calls us to end things. It says that there's a time to plant, but also a time to uproot what you've planted. Some of the things that you are working on right now, their season has passed. And you plant it. It said there's a time to embrace, but then a time to shun from embracing. And there's a time to search for an answer and try to make this ministry work or that project work or that strategy work. But there's a time to give up is lost. And what I find with leaders is that it's very hard to shut things down. It's very hard to say the season of that ministry is over. We were reaching the neighborhood that way with that particular, you know, the meets on Tuesday nights now and still, you know, it's been there for a while and at one time it was the right thing, but that season is over and it's time because God is gonna call something new into being, but we have to let go of what was in order to do that. And it's hard for leaders to do this. You know, one of the reasons is there's people attached to that stuff. And it's hard to shut things down. And it's hard to remove a person. Any of you got any wackos on your staff? Okay. Um, did you bring that person this morning? Turn to them and say, you need to listen to this right now. Now, I say that in fun, but the reality is that sometimes, somebody's not a wacko, but sometimes, sometimes somebody can be miscast and the season for them to run that ministry is gone. And God is nudging you to make a hard call that would be good for them, good for everybody else, and good for you. But it's hard for us to do that. Sometimes it's because somebody's not performing and the Bible's very clear about that. Sometimes it's because in the congregation there may be somebody leading something and they're divisive or even a team member that might be divisive. The Bible's very clear about an ending that needs to occur there after a second warning. 
But these things are hard to do. It's hard to create these necessary endings. But what I find is with leaders, the first thing you got to do is you got to focus on what is it we're trying to do, and then you got to evaluate everything and say, does it all fit into that path? And if it doesn't, it may be time to shut it down. And God has been doing this with people over the ages. He said to Abraham, you got to leave Ur because there's a city that God is building that he wants you to attend to that path, that the architect of that city is God. And I know there's stuff here, Abraham, that you're attached to, but it's time to do something different. Now, God may not be calling you out of your city or away from your church, but he may be calling you away from pouring time and energy into certain things because their season is over. And that's hard to do. And he did that over and over and over. And it's difficult for us to do, especially when people are involved. But sometimes it's just, it's just the season of that way of trying to reach the community is over. Maybe, I don't know your city, maybe it's time to lose the choir robes. Get a guitar. It's hard to find somebody to fix that organ nowadays anyway, right? <laughs> or some of you, maybe it's time to lose a guitar. See, we don't know until we seek God and know what he's calling us to do. But sometimes it's also going to mean we have to create some necessary endings around some things. I've got a friend, a business example of this. He bought a company that had about $25 million or so in sales when he bought it. And in a handful of years, he had built it to $500 million, and he was on his way to a billion. And I asked him one day, I said, how'd you do this? He said, well, and he would tell you it was a spiritual journey. He went before God and his group as he prayed through this and figured out what God was calling them to do. And he said, I realized that in everything that, you know, if this is 100% of what the company did, he said, and, and, and this was the phrase, the life of its mission was in about 20% of its activities. He said, in the other 80%, there, its season had passed. I said, oh, it, was it losing money? And he said, no, it was all profitable. He said, but the life was in that 20%. He said, and I called the team together in June, and I said, January 1st, I want all of this 80% to be gone. He said, and they protested, because people love that stuff, right? I mean, there are four people showing up at that group on Tuesday nights, and they love it. So he got protests. And that's hard because it gets into this stuff right here. And God may be calling you to step up and maybe redeem that no muscle that you haven't used in a long time. Because that no muscle got broken by wherever you came from and you've turned into a codependent leader. We got any codependents in here? Yeah? You know what a codependent is? It's somebody that right before they die, someone else's life flashes before their eyes. <laughs> so they have none. And it's hard to let go of this stuff, but I want to call you this morning to go before God and say, God, if this is where you're calling us to be and me to be, what steps of courage do I need to do to say no to some things and pull out of some things? Maybe that group was good for you 10 years ago at that phase of life, but now you need a different one. Who knows what this stuff is? It's hard. Sometimes it can be a person. These are some of the hardest calls. I remember I was talking to a pastor uh, not too long ago who said, I want to talk to you about my small groups person. Don't worry, there's nobody in this room. And he said, um, I don't know what to do to get him. He said he's, the small groups thing has been stuck for about four or five years under his leadership, and I think he's, he's miscast, and I don't know how to help him do better. And I said, well, why is he still running it? He said, well because we started the church together and everybody loves him and he goes into all these reasons. I go, I know that, but why is he still running it? 
He said, but well, because everybody loves him and I could never. I said, well, you're going to get what you've gotten. Is that what God has called you to steward over? And if he's miscast, God has some sort of better place for him. But that was hard to do because of the relationships. And it wasn't even a performance issue for him. He was just miscast in that role. It's time for a necessary ending of that role. Sometimes it is performance. I, I, when I was writing the book, Boundaries for Leaders, I, was, was, um, came, uh, I ran into a situation. This is a true story, by the way. I'm not making this stuff up. You could not make this up. <laughs> a father started a company and he built it to this big thing and he was about to retire and he's grooming his son to take it over. His oldest son was going to be the heir apparent and so he's in this, you know, succession plan and he's, he's training him and developing him and he's been doing this for a couple of years and he, he walks onto the factory floor and he sees his son angrily berating an employee in front of other employees. And he motioned for him to come up to his office and he takes him up to the office and he says, David, I wear two hats around here. I wear the boss hat and I also wear the father hat. I'm your boss and I'm your father. Right now I'm gonna put my boss hat on. You're fired. I will not have employees treated that way. I won't have that in the culture of this company. I won't have people in that kind of shame or that kind of embarrassment. I won't have that kind of, I don't want it anywhere here. I've told you about this repeatedly. We've tried to get you to work on it. I hired you somebody that you could go to. You won't do it. You won't see this as an issue. And so I gotta tell you, it's over, you're done. Your fire. Now, let me put my father hat on for a second. Son, I heard you just lost your job. Can I help? <laughs> when that was shared with me, I said, there is so much right with that story, I don't even know where to begin. Because sometimes, sometimes the most authentic leadership that you can do is to become one with what your gut knows and what God has been showing you, that sometimes you are his pruning function in somebody's life. And that's why everything's stuck. Because you know, when we prune things, I, when I was writing the book, I went and talked to some gardeners about pruning and this, this metaphor the Bible uses. It says you prune things in three scenarios. One, that a rose bush produces more buds than it can sustain. So you have, he has to find, he or she, the gardener has to find the best ones and cut off the good ones because the best ones need the resources of the bush. It's like my friend, cut, cut off the 80%. He said, because we want to focus all of our time and energy and people on this 20% where the life of the company is. And that's what pruning is. It's cutting away all this stuff that's not what we're supposed to be doing and cutting it away so the 20% can turn into 100 gazillion percent. That's what pruning does. And then the second instance is there's branches that are sick and they're not going to get well. They're resisting getting better. Like the young man. Or like strategies. Or things that are just sick and they're not going to get better because their season has passed. I've got two girls, 10 and 12, and we were eating breakfast not, not too long ago. And I, I, was, I was telling about this power team that goes into churches, you know, the strong guys. And I said, Olivia my oldest. I said, they can, they can pick up one of your teachers and lift them over their head. They can take a block of ice and, and punch it and it flies apart. I said, the one that amazes me the most is they can take a phone book and rip it in half. She looks at me and she says, what's a phone book? <laughs> She's 12 years old phone book. I mean, you can see her. You mean a Kindle? I mean, what's a phone? 
some of the stuff that your church or you may be invested in, time has passed. I was the next day, I was at JFK Airport. I'm standing in line next to this lady. I said, why are you here? She said, I'm here for business. I said, what do you do? She says, phone books. I said, oh, I bet that's cool. You guys are doing all the web stuff. She goes, no, we make yellow pages, phone books. I said, you should talk to my daughter. (laughs) What do you need to cut out of your life? It's taking time and energy. It's good, but it's not what God has called you to be or do or focus on. What's sick and is not going to get well because you've tried everything? I mean, the gardeners, they give it fertilizer and they move in the sun, they water it and, you know, they do everything they can to make the plant get better. They try. The Bible says we got to try, but sometimes it's not going to get well. I mean, in California, the garden, they, they, do, they fertilize them, they, 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 they water them, they move them in the sun, they clip them, they give them vitamins, they go down the street, get some medicinal marijuana, they talk to them. <laughs> But sometimes, like I grew up in the South, and they, you know, there's that dog ain't gonna hunt, and that just, it just ain't gonna hunt. <laughs> and it's time. And then the third thing they prune is sometimes there's things that are dead, and they're just in the way and not gonna get better. So you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that have been laid down beforehand so that you not someone else. You should walk in those works. And he wants to do a work in you to be able to see what those are and do those and not walk in everything else because that will make you crazy. So we've got to do this stuff and I'll, I'll close with this. When we start to do this, what we find is it's hard to do, right? It's hard to let go. Remember Lot's wife? There's a great little verse in the New Testament. I guess all the verses are great, but one that we kind of skip over and don't see how great it really is. Remember Jesus said this, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Just one little phrase. Remember Lot's wife? God was calling her to let go of some stuff because he had another place for her to go. And, And he said very specifically, don't look back. Don't hold on. And she did. She turned, looked back, and she, remember what it says? She turned into salt. She's still out there in the desert somewhere. Because she couldn't let go. She was attached to some things. And we, by nature, we humans are hoarders. We got any hoarders in here? Okay, thank you for raising your hand. Because normally, hoarders are in denial. Have you ever tried to help one? If you're codependent and anal, you know what that means? You're organized. You got your socks color-coded and you're codependent, you're all about helping people, you have volunteered a Saturday to help a hoarder, I guarantee you. You've got a friend, you said, I'll come get you organized, right? And you went, you went over to do that and help them. So you walk into their garage, and you look there, and you go, oh, how long has it been since you used this? And they go, 20 years. You say, well, let's throw this away. And, you, and, and, and when you start to throw it away, what do they say? I might need that. Really? They have electric ones now. (laughs) Hard to let go because they feel like they might need that. Why do they feel that way? Probably because somewhere in their life they they have come to feel that they are the source, that they must provide everything that they need probably happened in their growing up years. When they needed encouragement, it wasn't there. When they needed resources, they weren't there. When they needed love, it wasn't there. So they got to carry everything they need with them. And the Bible tells us, you are not your source. God is your source. And Abraham let go, not knowing what was out there, but he knew that the architect was God. And so for you to let go, you got to realize God will provide the needs for the next thing he's calling you to. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. And then the other reason we don't want to let go is we're emotionally attached. And you go over there and you say, what is this? And and she goes. It's Johnny's first poopy diaper. Well, that's what memories are for. You're not supposed to keep the thing. 
And she goes, no, he was so cute. And she can't let go or he can't let go of a time that has gone past. When the ministry was like this or it was like this, that time is over. You probably don't want to marry your prom date anyway. Some of you did, but you knew it was right. That time is over. Let it go. So we run into these fears, and the point is this. You cannot do it alone. That God has given you a body, and I want you to, the first thing you need to attend to is who are you connected to. In John 17, when he sent them out to attend to saving the planet, this group of 12 wackos, really dysfunctional people. He didn't pray for strategy. He didn't pray for resources. He didn't pray for anything except one thing. He prayed that they might be one. And you will never be able to attend and inhibit. And remember, nor will you be able to let go of things if you don't have people very, very close to you that are forcing you to do those things and giving you courage to do it. One of my favorite, favorite stories it's a research study about monkeys. This was back before PETA got control of the earth. <laughs> and they did animal research and they, they had these monkeys and they put them under stress in a cage. They didn't hurt them, but they just scared the living daylights out of them, right? Like loud noises and flashing lights and the monkeys are like freaking out like this. And so when they're really freaked out, they, they draw blood or urine samples and, and, and measure the stress hormones in their system because that's how you know how freaked out somebody is. You can measure the cortisol and other things and they measure it. So then they do one thing. They open the cage door and they put the monkey's buddy in there with him and close the door. That's all they did. Same stressors, same board of elders, same parishioners, Same flashing lights. The monkey is still freaked out, right? But they put his buddy in the cage and, 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 and close the door, and then they redraw the blood. Guess what? The stress hormones have dropped in half just because they are one. So here's my question in closing to you Who's your monkey? Turn to the person next to you and say, baby, be my monkey. I got to have somebody in the cage with me. Because God has called me to attend and inhibit and remember. And that means I got to let go. And I'm a hoarder and I am afraid. So hold my hand, kick me in the rear, and help me go forward through the desert because God has a promised land for me. God bless you guys.